Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snailus, where medicine makes perfect sense. We are continuing our discussion about our playlist called Pulmonology, and this is the 25th video in this amazing playlist. We'll talk about normal quiet breathing. So in the first two videos, we have talked about anatomy of the thorax, and it was clinically oriented. Then we have talked about the Firco's node, which is really important. Then we have talked about histology. Then we have talked about pharmacology, how to treat COPD, how to treat asthma, how to treat cystic fibrosis, etc. Then we talked about upper respiratory tract pathology. Then we will go to the lung. But first, we'll start with physiology. Let's know the normal first. Then we'll talk about pathology of the lung, the obstructive, the restrictive, the lung cancer, etc. Today is normal, quiet breathing. Let's be calm, guys. Let's calm down and let's get started. If I ask you what is the main job of the lung and you said to get oxygen in, wrong, it's to get carbon dioxide out. I don't believe you. Okay, remember, carbon dioxide is more important because life is only possible within a narrow range of change in pH. Okay, so let's say that we deal dealing with oxygen. Let's say that your oxygen saturation decreased from 99% to 94%. Oh well, you can survive. But let's say that your pH decreased from 7.4 to 6.8, you're dead, you're history. pH is very sensitive, pH is very important. That's why the most important role of the lung is to get rid of carbon dioxide. Why carbon dioxide? Because carbon dioxide plus water will give us something called carbonic acid, acidosis. Then this will give us H, which is the freaking acid, and then HACO3. So respiration, we have external respiration and internal or cellular. External is ventilation, perfusion, diffusion. Ventilation is to get air into the lung. Perfusion is to get blood into the vessel near the alveoli. Diffusion is for the oxygen to go this way and for the carbon dioxide to go this way. Then once oxygen is in the blood, it jumps on the red blood cells, then on the hemoglobin, then goes to the cell where cellular respiration occurs. This is the mitochondria. It uses oxygen to produce ATP. So ventilation and perfusion leading to diffusion, oxygen transport, then cellular respiration. Any problem with any of these steps will lead to something called hypoxia. There is no oxygen going to your tissue. Causes of hypoxia include ischemia, okay, so problem with the oxygen transport or problem with the perfusion, hypoxemia, which means less oxygen in the blood, and hemoglobin-related anomalies because, as you know, oxygen jumps on the hemoglobin. Please don't forget these three concepts, ventilation, perfusion, and diffusion. Ventilation, get air into the alveoli. Perfusion, get blood into these pulmonary arteries in close proximity to the alveoli. Diffusion, oxygen goes in and CO2 goes out. The alveolar membrane for diffusion, let's start with diffusion because it's the easier. This membrane is very thin, has a huge surface area. It's like a tennis court, huge, six layers. So let's start with the alveoli like this. So there is fluid in the alveoli. That's why we have fluid and we have air. Therefore, we have something called surface tension, if you remember your physics. Okay, then we have alveolar epithelium. Let's do some nice epithelium here. This is type 1 pneumocytes, which is squamous, to allow for space for gas exchange because we need the cell to be very thin, called squamous epithelium. Then we have the epithelial basement membrane, which is here. And then we have fluid in the interstitial space. So here is the interstitial space. And then we have capillary endothelium. So let's do the endothelium of those nice capillaries. And after this capillary endothelium, there is the endothelial basement membrane. Let's talk about this diffusion of gas, oxygen and CO2 out. No ATP, no carrier. Therefore, it's a simple diffusion because you're breathing all day. If it required ATP, you'll be dead or you'll be eating all the time to produce ATP for this diffusion. But thankfully, it's simple diffusion. Excellent. So this depends on diffusion is proportional to, you can say diffusion equals and then you multiply it by constant, who cares? 
So directly proportional to pressure difference, the greater the pressure difference, the easier the diffusion. Area, the greater the surface area, the easier the diffusion. That's why if this area is like, there is a problem with the area, if it's decreased, such as emphysema, which destroys all of the alveoli, you will have problem with diffusion. Temperature, of course. Solubility, the more soluble, the easier the diffusion. And then molecular size in, is inversely proportional. The bigger the molecule, the harder it is, the harder for it to pass. And then thickness of the membrane, which is L, the thicker the membrane, the lesser the diffusion. And then we have viscosity, we can do V here, but it's very insignificant because the viscosity of water is one, so multiply by one is nothing. Let's have clinical correlation. In pulmonary fibrosis, which is an intrinsic interstitial lung disease, there is fibrosis here of the membrane. So we have decrease L, which is thickness, therefore we have decreased diffusion. Now, there is something called the AA gradient, which we will talk about it later. A means alveolar, which is big A, and small a means arterial. This AA gradient should be between 5 and 15. But if you have thickening of this membrane, such as pulmonary fibrosis, you will have decreased diffusion. So not every A here will be capable of passing to the capillary here. So the gradient or the difference between AA is going to widen and it's going to be more than 15, let's say more than 30. And this is really important. Whenever you have a, a disease in the lung, like a primary lung disease, the AA gradient will widen. But if the disease is external to the lung, such as the thoracic wall, let's say I have myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, the AA gradient is normal. Now let's talk about CO2 and oxygen. Okay, first let's talk about the molecular size. You know, CO2 is CO and 2, and O2 is just O2. So this is a bigger molecule because it contains carbon. Oxygen doesn't contain a carbon. So if you left it just to the size of the molecule, oxygen has the upper hand when it comes to diffusion. Oxygen should diffuse easily because remember we had diffusion and diffusion was proportional to 1 over m. CO2 has higher m and therefore low diffusion, but oxygen has lesser m and therefore greater diffusion. Okay, so when it comes to that molecular size, oxygen is better in diffusion. Okay, we get it. But this is not the whole story. Remember, I told you that the main function of the lung is to get the CO2 out. So the CO2's diffusion has to be greater, if you think about it. Here comes something called the solubility or the diffusion coefficient. If you remember, diffusion was proportional to area times pressure difference, so delta P times A times solubility over M. So solubility is directly proportional to diffusion. When it comes to solubility, CO2 is 24 times as soluble as oxygen. Therefore, when you combine 1 and 2 together, CO2 has the upper hand by far, no questions asked. If you compare the net diffusion, CO2 is better in diffusion. That's why the main function of your lungs is not to get the oxygen in, but to get the CO2 out, because life is only possible within a very narrow range of change in pH, between 7 and 7.7. .7. Less than 7, you die from acidosis. More than 7.7, .7, you die from alkalosis. So when you wake up every morning, you should be thankful that the solubility or the diffusion coefficient of CO2 is greater than that of oxygen. Otherwise, you'd have been dead of acidosis. So be grateful, you selfish, ungrateful twit. Forgive my language, I'm just messing with you. Physiology of normal quiet breathing. It's called eupnea because eu means normal and p-n-e-a means breathing. You remember eu thyroid, it's not hypo, it's not hyper, it's eu, it's normal. So eu normal, nea, breathing. That's why apnea, a means no, it's called no breathing. 
That's why we have a gamma globulinemia, which means no gamma globulins in the blood. So a means no in Greek. That's why we have the word atom. Tom means to cut down. A means no, because atom they thought that is this is the smallest thing ever. It's the smallest building unit of matter. They call it atom. You cannot cut it down into smaller sections. Hypopnea. Hypo means low and PNEA means breath. So this is decreased breathing. Hyperpnea is increased breathing. Orthopnea. Okay, think about it. ortho means erect. Okay, straight. Orthopnea, erect breathing. So when you are erect, you're breathing fine. But then you get dyspnea on lying down. This is called orthopnea. Ortho erect, nea, breathing. So when I'm erect, when I'm ortho, I get nea, which is excellent. When I'm erect, when I'm upright, I'm breathing. Good. But when I lie down, I get dyspnea. This is the definition of orthopnea. Platypnea is the opposite. Platy means flat. Nea means breathing. When I'm flat, when I'm lying down on the bed, I'm breathing fine. But then when I'm upright, when I sit up, I get dyspnea. So platypnea is opposite to orthopnea. If you understand the language, you'll get it. Ortho, straight, nea, breathing. I breathe well when I'm straight. Platypnea, platy means flat, and nea means breathing. When I'm flat on bed, I breathe fine. Tripopnea, tripo means side, dyspnea on lying only on one side. So if I, if I lie on my right side, I get dyspnea. If I lie on my left side, I can breathe normally. By the way, I've talked about platypnea in a previous video. So what are the causes of tripopnea? Side breathing. So dyspnea on lying on one side rather than the other causes. Number one, lying on the good side. Let's say that we have a patient with bad lung. Let's say pulmonary fibrosis and the fibrosis is in the left lung. This patient will lie on the right side to increase perfusion to the normal right side. It's called gravity, baby. Okay. How about lying on the affected side? Let's say we have a patient with lung abscess. Patient has abscess in the left lung. He will lie on his left side to try to put pressure on the abscess to block it so that he doesn't cough which is a productive cough he doesn't cough the sputum and the mucus and the pus and all of this nasty stuff but if this patient wants to cough and to clear his lungs he can lie on the normal side third tripopnea only while lying on the right side this is CHF, baby, CHF, congestive heart failure or chronic heart failure. Why? To increase the venous return and increase the cardiac output. Because if you remember your anatomy, if this is the heart, the vena cava comes to the right side of the heart. So the patient lies on the right side. Thanks to gravity, he can pull more blood into the veins and then more blood comes to the heart. Okay, let's have some fun. Let's have this very simplistic analogy. Get a balloon, blow the balloon up, inflate the balloon, but then don't tie it from the top. So it contains what? It contains air. And you are not tying it from here. What's gonna happen to the air if you leave it alone? Pew! It's gonna escape and the balloon is gonna deflate. The lung is like the balloon that has air, but it's not tied from above. And this is really crucial. If you leave the lung alone, it's gonna do what? It's gonna recoil, baby. It's called elastic recoil because lung has something called elastin and this elastin is elastic protein because IN means protein and elast means elastic. So if you leave the lung alone, if the lung had it its way, it's gonna recoil. Okay, fine, we get it. There is nothing attaching the lungs to the chest wall. Your lungs like it's a, it's a free spirit the lung is floating inside the rib cage the only exception is the hilum who cares so you might say okay if this is the lung and here is the freaking chest wall why doesn't the lung just like recoil and collapse and we die i'll tell you my friend because the chest wall tends to expand the lungs tend to recoil when you have two surfaces and they are going away from each other, you are creating a negative pressure in between, 
which prevents them from separating, which is a very sophisticated idea in physics. And that's why your intra-plural pressure is negative. Which brings us to my words of wisdom. The negative intraplural pressure is due to the dynamic harmonious antagonism between the chest wall which wants to expand and the lungs which tend to recoil. Let's compare between inspiration and expiration. Inspiration is active because it requires muscles, but expiration is passive because it's just passive man thanks to the elastic recoil of the lung, thanks to the elastic fibers. I made a mistake. Duration. If it requires muscles, muscles are strong. So the duration of inspiration is shorter, the duration of expiration is longer. So let me breathe normally for you. <sighs> Which one is longer? Expiration. So if you put the stethoscope on the trachea, you will hear it like this. This is inspiration. <sighs> this is expiration. <sighs> And then there is a pause called respiratory pause. Let's talk physics, baby. When you inspire, you get air in. The volume of the lung increases. When the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And this is called Boyle's law. When the volume increases, the pressure decreases as long as the temperature remains constant and vice versa. When the volume decreases, the pressure increases as long as the temperature is constant. Okay, so when you inspire or you inhale, you increase the volume. Therefore, you decrease the pressure. What pressure are you talking about? I'm talking about the intrapulmonary pressure. So pressure decreased from being atmospheric into negative one. When the pressure decreases, it pulls in stuff. By this stuff, I mean air. That's why you inspire. So you're trying to inspire. You inflate your lung, increase volume, therefore decrease pressure. When you decrease pressure, the pressure sucks the air in. And that's how you breathe in. Let's talk about expiration. Decrease the volume thanks to the elastic recoil, therefore increase pressure from being atmospheric into being positive one. When the pressure is positive, it pushes the air out. <sighs> what happens in the inspiration? The diaphragm descends. The external intercostals contract. Why the external? Because here is your chest wall and here are your ribs. You want to contract those externals on the outside to lift the chest cage upwards and outwards. That's why it's external intercostals and not internal intercostals. So they elevate the ribs and therefore increase the transverse diameter. They evert the ribs and therefore increase the AP diameter. Expiration. What muscles are responsible for expiration? And the answer is none. It's a completely passive process. And here's a very smart question for your exam. They will tell you, imagine that you're an Englishman sitting at five o'clock tea time and you're sipping your nice cup of tea. Okay. While you're sipping your cup of tea, you're breathing in and breathing out quietly. Which of the following muscles is responsible for expiration? And the answer is none of the above. Expiration is a passive process thanks to the lung's recoil. Accessory muscles for forced inspiration or expiration. If you want a forced inspiration like this, <gasps> this is forced. We need the sternocleidomastoid from above, the serratus anterior from the side, and the scalene muscles from above. If you want to forcefully exhale, okay, or if you have an obstructive lung disease, you're struggling to get the air out and you're wheezing like this. So you need forced expiration. Now you need muscles, but normal people during quiet breathing do not need any muscles. But if you have COPD or if you wanna forcefully expire, you will need expiratory muscles, such as what? Internal intercostals. They are on the inner side of the chest wall, therefore they pull the chest wall inwards. Also abdominal muscles, especially the abdominal recti, and we call this abdominal breathing. And when we talk about COPD patients later, I will tell you that they have barrel chest, because the air is trapped, as well as abdominal breathing. If you observe the patient's body and chest, from that foot side of the bed, 
you will see that they are not breathing by the, their chest, they are breathing by their abdominal muscles. What is the effect of inspiration on heart murmurs? Inspiration accentuates the right-sided murmurs because when you inhale, the pleural pressure is negative and it's sucking air in. It's also sucking blood upwards through your veins, through your inferior vena cava and to your nice heart. More blood, more murmur. Therefore, all of the murmurs on the right side of the heart are going to be accentuated means they increase. Except two important things. Mitral valve prolapse and HOCM. So here's the rule. More blood, more murmur. In every single murmur. Except mitral valve prolapse and HOCM. In these two cases, more blood means less murmur. Why? We will talk about this in our cardiology lectures in the future. Because as they say in New York, it's complicated. Next, let's talk about expiration. The opposite happens. The pressure is positive. It's pushing the air outwards and it's also pushing the blood downwards. Therefore, there is no blood in your heart. So, expiration will decrease those murmurs in the right side and it will increase the murmurs on the left side of the heart with two major exceptions, mitral valve prolapse and HOCM. Let's breathe normally, guys. Inspiration, <gasps> expiration, <sighs> which is longer, and then a pause. Expiration is longer, it's two to one ratio because inspiration is active, so there is muscles, therefore fast. Expiration is passive, therefore slow. Slow. Beware, when you auscultate the chest, when you put the stethoscope on the lung, you're gonna hear inspiration like this. <sighs> so you might say, oh, inspiration is longer. I just heard inspiration and I didn't hear expiration. Okay, honey, you have been fooled because expiration is so weak. You didn't hear these two thirds. You only heard the first one third. So what is the solution? Put the stethoscope on the trachea and you will hear it like this. Which one's longer? Expiration. But when you put the stethoscope on the chest, inspiration is going to be longer because you didn't hear the rest of expiration and this is normal. It's normally to find like this. That's normal if you're auscultating the chest. Please don't be fooled. Is it possible for this respiratory pause to disappear? Yes, on rapid breathing. If you're ventilating like this, <laughs> there is no pause or during exercise. If you want to have some fun facts, here is a fun fact for you. You can read it if you wish. Respiratory rate is one of the four vital signs. What are the four vital signs? Number one is the temperature. Number two is the blood pressure. Then we have the respiratory rate and we have the heart rate. So respiratory rate, one of the four vital signs. If your crazy doctor asks you, what is the fifth vital sign? Please let me know the answer down below in the comments. This is a very good question. Normal respiratory rate is 10 to 18. Some of you say 20. If you ask any pulmonologist, like a doctor who actually treats the patient, not your physiology professor who sits in his office which is air conditioned and theorize about the outside world pulmonologists will tell you that 20 is hyperventilating so just say to 10 to 18 okay there are three types of pressure intrapulmonary pressure the pressure in your lung or in your alveoli and this could be positive or negative there is also the intrapleural pressure and this is always negative as long as you are normal transpulmonary or transmural pressure and this is the difference between these two pressures Okay, for the pros, transpulmonary and intrapleural have the same amount, but they have the opposite charge. If it's intrapleural, it's going to be negative. If it's transpulmonary, it's going to be positive. So let's say that the, your normal intrapleural pressure was negative, let's say 6. At that same time, your transpulmonary pressure is going to be positive 6. So they have the same amount, but they are different in the charge. Let's talk about airway resistance. So you have here your bronchi and here is your bronchial. Okay, let's talk about first flow. What is flow? Flow is volume over time. So V over T is the flow. Okay, flow also equals the pressure difference. So P1 minus P2 
over the resistance. So here is the flow. Resistance is inversely proportional to radius. Also, you can do it like this, 1 over r. So the greater the radius, the lower the resistance, the greater the flow. The lesser the radius, the greater the resistance, the lesser the flow. Okay, got it. Now let's me, let me ask you a question. Here is your bronchi, here is your bronchial. Which one is going to have more resistance? So you will say, okay, resistance is opposite to the radius. Since the bronchial has a smaller radius, therefore it's going to have increased resistance. Therefore, the resistance of the bronchial is greater than the bronchi, right? Wrong. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, you don't count the radius of just one bronchial. You count the radius of the whole bronchiolar tree. And in that case, you will have increased radius. The radius of the bronchiole is greater than the radius of the bronchi. And therefore, the resistance in the bronchiole is lesser or lower than the resistance in the bronchi. The most resistant passage in your whole respiratory tract is the bronchi. Here is the greatest resistance. So where is the greatest resistance? Answer, bronchi. Same thing in the arteries. It's not the capillaries. It's the arteriole. That's why people have bronchial asthma, because it has the greatest resistance. That's why we give bronchodilators, not bronchiolodilator, because nobody cares about this. The greatest resistance is here. The trouble is here. Think. Here's a smart question. So we have agreed that the greatest resistance in, in the bronchi. Okay. Now, is the resistance greater during inspiration or expiration? Use this formula. During expiration, the radius is decreasing because the air is escaping. Therefore, the resistance is increasing. So the greatest resistance in your entire lung is in the bronchi during expiration. And this is going to be very, very, very important when we talk about obstructive lung diseases later. That's why we have asthma. The problem is in the bronchi, not the bronchioles. That's why we gave bronchodilators, not bronchiolodilators, because the greatest resistance is in the bronchi during expiration. That's why if you have an obstructive lung disease, you have a problem during expiration, not inspiration. You have a problem getting the air out. That's why your expiration is prolonged. It's like this. Inspiration is normal. <sighs> But then expiration is like this. We call this prolonged expiration and wheezes. Oh, medicine is hard, said no medicosis student ever. If you are struggling to learn about Legionella, Mycoplasma, Pseudomonas, Rhinovirus, Staph and Streptin, E. coli, and all of this crazy stuff, check out this website called Picmonic, Pictures in Mnemonic. See the link in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. You can support my work by going to patreon.com slash medicosis. I'll send you my notes, my cases, my famous note called triads in medicine, my audio notes. It's, it's just amazing. Please go to Patreon, guys. You can subscribe to YouTube. Please do it and hit the bell to get notified. Go to my Facebook page. I have more than 100 cases there. And if you go to Patreon and subscribe, I'll send you my Dropbox folders. These folders have my notes organized about systems and it's just awesome. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.